Folks, what you just heard was a musical rendition by Professor Fawzi Afzal Khan, who happens to be in the studio with us. Welcome, Professor Saiba. Thank you, Dr. Saab. What are your motivations for making these series of <coughs> rather um, contemporary videos? Well, um, you know, I was in Pakistan uh, visiting. I was on sabbatical from my institution here where I teach in, the, in New Jersey, and I was in Lahore. And um, it was a very, uh, I've always been interested in music, just, uh, you know, this music for its own sake. I've been trained uh, in uh, Indian classical as a young uh, girl growing up in Pakistan before I came here. So, I mean, I love making music and it was a chance, um, you know, I had decided to perform. I was invited actually to perform at uh, one of the largest uh, performing arts festivals that is held annually in Lahore. It's held in Lahore every year in uh, around November or so um, under the auspices of the Peer, uh, it's called the Peer Festival of Performing Arts and a very large component of it is dedicated to uh, world music and uh, so I was invited this year to actually be the opening act on their uh, music world uh, music night for fusion music. So after that, I started thinking, you know, I really would like to do something which um, I can also take back and show to uh, my friends and colleagues and maybe use it in some way in my work also. So I'm always looking for opportunities to bring my artistic um, interests uh, into the classroom and into what I teach and what I research. So I was lucky enough to find a young uh, recording artist who heard me who said, why don't you come over to my recording studio? We can maybe experiment, um, uh, you know, with what you do, what you are singing, what you might like to do. And he was very interested, actually, himself. His name is Faraz. And uh, the uh, first uh, the sacrifice, um, that particular recording was done in his studio in Lahore. And that came about because, uh, you know, we were just experimenting with music. And I'm also a poet. I, And he wanted something, you know, which I could make more contemporary. but also rooted in the traditions of that uh, area and for a long time here as well uh, I have uh, been working with jazz musicians for example Before in the United go to jazz, States. Saba, let me ask you in that uh, video that we just saw a little earlier you talk about sacrifice yes. and you talk about gendered notion of that sacrifice. Right. Uh, Talk to us a little bit more about that, please. Well, I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, as I was saying, that when I started working with uh, this musician, Faraz, and we were, you know, just sort of playing, really, at making music in his studio, I became very inspired one evening thinking about, um, you know, these ideas that um, sort of uh, came up in the poem, which is really the basis from which then the music arose. Uh, that poem just came to me one night as we were singing and he was playing some notes of different melodies on his um, on his keyboard and I just asked him for a pen and pencil you know a pe pen and paper and I said I just feel like writing uh, and that's how the poem actually uh, got written and it came out of this uh, you know for a long time I, I, I mean I'm a teacher of uh, a professor also who works in the area of women's studies uh, feminist theory uh, global feminism and so on and uh, most recently peace and justice studies and so I started really thinking and I have been thinking about the issues that confront the world uh, currently and uh, particularly this era of unending war and violence that we uh, have been plunged into um, uh, since 9-11, not that it wasn't happening before, but it's come to the surface in a, in a new and palpable and a much more frightening way since then. And that led me to think about gendered notions of violence. I mean, you know, would uh, a woman leader of the free world, would she be any better uh, at uh, preventing uh, the world from reaching what I feel is really an apocalyptic moment uh, in which we can easily destroy ourselves and our planet? Um, uh, or is violence turned outward really a male phenomenon? And then somehow my questioning led me to thinking about notions of sacrifice and how we associate sacrifice primarily with, uh, with mothers who send their sons off to war and they're meant to be sacrificing for the homeland, for homeland security and so on. Where do these notions come from and where do they take us and where have they taken us in terms of the world that we live in? So that's really what was playing on my mind. And of course, uh, very ironically, 
after I wrote the poem, uh, you know, Benazir Bhutto in Pakistan got assassinated and in her latest book, which she was working on at the time, she talks about sacrifice and the notion of Karbala. So I started thinking about, you know, and people talked about her death as the death of a martyr and that she was really, it's a sacrifice uh, that she made for the cause of democracy in Pakistan and so on. So these things obviously were there in the air, in the atmosphere. I was picking up on them and being a poet and a creative person, they somehow made their way into the poem and then later into the music itself. Well, as I heard you s sing your own words, your own poem, it called to my mind a uh, famous couplet by Ahmadim Qasmi. I so I think you had made a distinction in your yes. <coughs> elaboration between male and female expression yes. of sorrow yes. and sacrifice. Talk to us about the connection between sorrow and sacrifice as you see it. You know, there is a very deep connection. Um, it's a complicated question and I think um, I probably I cannot answer it adequately, but I feel that there is obviously a deep connection which I'm sure all of us can see because sacrifice uh, entails sorrow. Um, and I, when I was thinking about absolutely, and I do draw this distinction between <coughs> sort of male and female approaches to an understanding of and the lived experience of sacrifice, that I think um, sort of generally, and st speaking in obviously generalizations, because I think there are exceptions to this, that generally what we call not male necessarily, but masculinist is a better word, mm -hmm. um, which has to do with sort of patriarchal, the notions uh, that have evolved under patriarchal ways of thinking uh, that have been with us for so, for so long, um, that masculinist uh, ways of expressing or dealing with uh, sacrifice and sorrow are quite different. And generally speaking that notion you know the masculinist notion is more sort of sacrifice as something that can be seen externally that can then be um, you know also validated externally um, that calls attention to itself as uh, uh, you know a, a code of honor and 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 something that is associated associated with male uh, visions or masculinist visions of honor which often then are visited very negatively upon women and women's bodies. And so you have talked about Muharram, I think. And then reference. in that connection, Muharram came, became a kind of metaphoric construct that I started working with in, in the poem itself. And um, also, you know, then was uh, visualized in the, in the video that was made uh, about the song in the poem. And in there, you know, I've uh, been fascinated by the self-flagellation, which is a form of mourning and sorrow, but it refers to the, the sacrifice um, of uh, Hazrat Hussain and Hassan. It is usually men who are seen out there on the streets, uh, in the Tazir processions, uh, during the um, uh, month of Muharram, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the Shias sort of uh, commemorate really the world over uh, that sacrifice. Uh, made, um, you know, at, at Karbala where the uh, brothers both were, you know, they were um, uh, killed for their beliefs and for what they stood for by the, the tyrant Yazid. And uh, it's the women generally are observers. You know, they have their own spaces where they express mourning and they beat on their chest, but that is not a spectacle. So in some ways, sacrifice, male sacrifice to me seems to be more of, a spectacle. more of a spectacle than an internal thing. And that made me think about, uh, you know, when we talk, particularly the discourse around war is often sold to us as, you know, we are sacrificing uh, our young men primarily although women have entered the armed forces, particularly in the West, in Western countries, uh, certainly in the US, but it's really a male spectacle of violence, of war directed outward and the sacrifices that men make, but then, and that's, you know, by actually going out there and putting their lives in the line of fire for their motherland usually. And so the motherland, interestingly, is the figure of the woman and the mother um, and the background of Karbara also. You have the sisters end up singing about the brothers um, and so the women's role is always about singing 
about or otherwise commemorating the sons and the lovers and the husbands who have gone off and lost their war. So their role is much more passive and more of the sort of visible mourning, but not necessarily of actually loss of life per se. But Dr. Sabha, it seems to me that there is one level that you've described. Then there is almost a pre-feminist moment of feminism that we see in Sufi poets. Mm -hmm. And there I think the recognition of this yes. feminine voice becomes very important because most of the Sufi poets speak in the voice of a female. Correct. Right? And I think that Ranja Ranja Kardini me Ape Ranja Hoi Akko Ni Manu Dido Ranja Heer Na Akhe Koi. Alright. So that's written by a male Sufi poet who takes on that persona and that voice. Let's talk about that voice. Why do you think Sufi poets felt that the feminine voice was more appropriate to a more committed form of love? I mean, I think that for me as a woman, that's obvious. I'm glad that we had Sufi male <laughs> poets who thought that way as well. But I think precisely um, because the feminine one is, is that part of hum what we have learned to call or name as the feminine is that part of humanity which is associated traditionally with, uh, with love, with compassion, with our urge towards peace and tolerance and getting on and getting uh, on with each other. Um, and I think that the Sufi poets um, that I know whose work has inspired me also and inspired other um, activists uh, in Pakistan whose work I have studied and with whom I've worked with closely on theater and on other aspects of performance. Uh, and they too have been drawn uh, to Sufi poetry and the poetry of uh, you know, Baba Ghulam Farid and Baba Bulle Shah uh, and, and others of their ilk because they, these people are uh, you know, elaborating a vision of a tolerant, compassionate, pluralist society and ethos. And I think they couldn't have done that without drawing on that what we call the feminine principle. And I think the mistake that patriarchy has made is to uh, engender these visions or versions of human beings which are which radically oppose the masculinist or male on the one side and the feminine or the female on one on the other, as though they are completely separate spheres, very different. And so men brought up by and large under that kind of ideology tend to want to excise the feminine from their own personas, their personalities, their value system and so on. And I think that that kind of excision and distancing of the feminine from the masculine has led us really to, uh, you know, it's a simple or perhaps even simplistic way of putting it, but at some level I believe this very deeply, that um, that is precisely why we are but at this but juncture. Wouldn't you, say, wouldn't you say that in Punjabi Sufi poetry, the feminine principle is twice reinforced, first by taking on the female persona, and then reaching back to the mother. Yeah. Yeah. So how do we see this double reinforcement? Not only the poet itself takes on the person of a female, but goes back to mother, another female. Because I think there is this yearning mm -hmm. for the comfort and the security and those moments of peace that a mother's lap brings forth in the male imaginary. And certainly in the West, two people, you know, psycho psychoanalysts, psychoanalytic theorists like Jacques Lacan, mm -hmm. Who has then later been also, rev you know, revised and taken. His work has been taken further by many uh, renowned feminist theorists like uh, Siksu or Irigure, Julia Kristeva, and uh, they have all talked about this pre-patriarchal, um, you know, what they call the pre-imaginary of the of the male, that that state of being that the child knows before entering into the language of the law, which is the language of the father, which excises the feminine principle. And it is that area where you know, our, our desires are not necessarily vocalized, verbalized, but they are linked to the maternal body. It is that longing that I think our Sufi poets knew and understood much before Jacques Lacan came along and wrote about that. Well, of course, don't we need to say that Jacques Lacan's critique is more appropriate and more valid for the West, less so for the East, 
And if you go next door to India, for instance, look at their whole mm -hmm. pantheon of gods and goddesses. Correct. The picture becomes far more complex and Western model perhaps is not readily applicable. I think to that, to some degree, you are quite correct. But to some degree, I think that we also see very extreme forms of patriarchy in the East, mm -hmm. in those societies which have, um, at the same time that they have uh, this you know, kind of poetry and um, certainly in, in, in India where uh, in, in the religion and the form of the philosophy of Hinduism or the go goddesses that you're talking about, that at the, at unfortunately patriarchy has taken root there in ways. In Sati, for instance. In Sati, for of instance, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. It, you know, and then we see with the uh, uh, advent of a particular version of, you know, in contemporary times, you would say that the Obandi school of Islam, which is linked to, you know, sort of a Wahhabist interpretation of Islam that takes us away from Sufi versions, that that kind of, those kinds of patriarchal beliefs and models have not just disappeared and they are in fact reinforced by these other models of, of, of uh, religious belief in that region. And those models follow very much, sim very similar trajectory to Western patriarchy. I don't think they are so different. And to that degree, I think uh, the work of people like Lacan and the other French feminists that I mentioned are, in fact, quite useful. And I mean, I think that um, also in terms of Sufi poetry, that while at the one hand, I think it's, it's fabulous and wonderful that their work celebrates the divine in the form of uh, something that we might call a feminine principle that we see in their references to the mother and you know the beloved and so on that at some level they also unfortunately reinforce i think um, a particular vision of the woman that is then you know just circumscribed by the role of the mother and the beloved so they have their own limitations. All right, that, that conti we'll continue with that discussion. We are going to listen to a little more music and then we'll take a short break. After break, we'll come back and talk about these patterns and to what extent they limit or liberate the female principle in all of us. Stay there. blood curdles to speckle the surface of skin's disease. Blood of beautiful boys bursts 
through the chains of mothers and lovers, deep inside, somewhere. Lost to this manly ritual of torture on display. Welcome back. Today we are talking here to a multi-talented guest, Professor Fawzi Abdul Khan. She is a professor at the Montclair State University in New Jersey. She is also author of numerous books, including Cultural Imperialism and the Indo-English Novel and the Preoccupation of Post-Colonial Studies. Recently, she has produced three musical videos. They are named Making the Sacrifice, Smokescreen, and Sacrifice. Welcome, Professor Saiba. Thank you, Lara. Now, we were talking about your second video, Smokescreen, what is the difference between, let's say, Sacrifice and Smokescreen? Well, firstly, I think is the field. Or there's no difference. <laughs> it's on a continuum. I think <laughs> I am uh, working with, um, sort of uh, thematically working with the same, within the same area, which is my preoccupation, I think, with gendered roles, gendered behavior, uh, particularly in the context of the socio-cultural background that I come from, uh, uh, which happens to have been Pakistan and, uh, you know, now with the resurgence of a particular kind of um, very orthodox or extreme uh, extremist um, understanding of Islam, which as when I was growing up in Pakistan was really not the case. So my work is meant to challenge a lot of these uh, binaries, if you will, uh, between um, you know, male and female um, sort of uh, behaviors, what is expected of a woman, questioning why, where does it come from, uh, challenging patriarchal and religious and other ideologies that constrict or constrain the role of women. So in sacrifice, I, I was definitely concerned with how do we as women, uh, citizens, female citizens of not just any one state but the world, how do we uh, try to refashion some of the things that have gone terribly wrong and what can we bring to the table as women, um, uh, you know, with our sort of being steeped in what we talked about as the feminine principle. I think in, uh, and I there also had uh, recourse to traditional, um, musically something very traditional, even though, um, you know, it was set against a track that has a very contemporary sound, but I was singing a uh, from Baba Bulle Shah's, um, one of his poems, and it was in sung in the Kafi style. Um, and uh, now in, 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 in a smoke screen, which is much more playful in feel, I think, um, I am singing actually a song which was popularized in Bollywood, in a Bollywood film. And the character that I play in smoke screen uh, 
um, sort of goes back and forth between a present moment in which he's singing the song with a jazz musician, he's playing the, the saxophone. So I'm bringing sort of Eastern and Western elements together because I think it's important that that is one binary that also should be challenged. I uh, want to come back to this East and West issue, but let me ask you a question before then. And that's the question of the tradition that you have said, you know, not only the musical tradition, but also the poetic tradition. In there, Najim Hussain Sayyid in his book, The Recurring Patterns of Punjabi Poetry has argued that the Sufi poet actually deals with the known and then suddenly surprises with the mm -hmm, unknown. Mm -hmm. So the woman who is going away and she is singing the traditional Babla song, asking her father to keep him her one more day mm -hmm. and wailing to her mother and so on, but finally gives and leaves. Suddenly, in case of the Sufi poet, the poet refuses to accept the tyranny of the moment or the tyranny of the system. Absolutely. And therefore is always stepping outside of that known Correct. pattern. pattern. So, so that's a wonderful segue into what I wanted to say. I mean, uh, you know, which is that I think I must be a Sufi mm -hmm. because uh, really that has always been my impulse. And I think with the video, the second video, um, Smoke Screen, I talk, I mean, if you think about the title itself, it's a smoke screen, you know, mm -hmm. what we, the things that we think are so may not be so. <laughs> and um, it is a challenge and the set no, may pattern... I, may, I, may I just inter interrupt you to say what you call smoke screen? Traditionally, Sufis have called them hijab. Gee, and that's yeah, why so the very famous book by Data Ganji Bash, Kashful Mahjub, Lifting the Veil. Lifting, lifting the, the Veil, yes. absolutely. Lifting the smoke screen, so to speak. So that, in a sense, is what I was trying to do very, um, you know, in a very humble sort of way uh, in this um, rather playful video, which I also want people to enjoy. Um, so it's not that it has, you know, some prop like message, like a you know piece of propaganda. It is a music video, but I think that if you look at the character of the woman, she is being may formed. I, She's also. I, <laughs> may I ask you a question? Because you said there is no message. It's not propaganda. It's a piece. Of, I think you said musical art, video yes. art. Do you think art has a message? <coughs> well, I or think should it? I don't think that art should uh, have a message that it wears on its sleeve because then it wouldn't be art. Then mm -hmm. it should be called something else, mm -hmm. you know, a political tract, for example. But I think that um, certainly I believe in, in art or a vision of art that is linked to life. Mm -hmm. And if it's linked to life and it's linked to the person uh, who is raised in a particular way and has uh, her own ideas about, um, you know, things going on around her and has experienced life in a particular way, has something to say, it will come out in that artistic vision. So to that degree, I think all art is perhaps political if we mm -hmm. think of politics in a much broader way mm -hmm. than as a narrow kind of propaganda. And so, you know, to, to answer your earlier question about um, stepping out of the bound, I mean, I've tried in this video to step out of the Bollywood tradition because I think the f when it opens, there's this woman who is singing, uh, you know, Bollywood song that would be familiar to those audiences. And so they might be lulled into thinking it's just going to be this video about a woman singing to a beloved or, you know, because really the lyrics of the song um, sort of play on that. Uh, but what ends up happening through the course of the video is that she's challenging, you know, it, the first setting is also military contonement. Um, and she's followed by, she's looking over her shoulder and there is a man who is following her who then picks up, uh, you know, her words, which we find out later that she's also a writer. And so she's running through the duration of this video and uh, in the black and white footage, particularly those moments. And she ends up at one shot in front of the uh, Bad Shahi Mosque. And at that point, she's, you know, the w one half of her is singing and she's also talking on the cell phone and at that time she's not garbed uh, you know in a hijab or covered up as we you know so there is that element of challenge that who can say or who decides you know what is appropriate or inappropriate um, dress codes for women um, and why should it be that there is this tremendous separation between what we call the sacred and the profane maybe there isn't maybe we need to look at the world differently and then by the end of course she is also there is a you know there is a little bit thrown in in the you know the character when she's singing at this cafe um, she's reading uh, a new contemporary newspaper which says uh, you know lawyers want 
uh, to try Musharraf for treason. So there are these little political things that are thrown in there in this kind of very pastiche, which is a very postmodernist technique, um, to suggest that the video is multi-layered and needs to be read at a number of different levels. And then by the end, you know, she, the, the man who has been following her, we can see him like looking for things, looking for some way to, to perhaps get to the woman and to possess her through her words, through her music. But uh, eventually is he's dead auto, on the it, floor is it and she leaves. Too? I'm sorry? Does it have autobiographical <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> gosh, um, that's an interesting question. I think all art is autobiographical <laughs> to some degree, but I think it's meant to invoke this larger context of patriarchy and uh, military industrial complex. I think these things are, you know, very interlinked. And... Um, a system in which sort of women are generally chaste. Uh, but isn't there a double metaphor here that military industrial complex in some ways has done to the civil society what patriarchy has done to women? I mean, that's a wonderful. I'm not going to say yes or no. I think that's your interpretation. <laughs> but I, I think that the video lends itself, as mm -hmm. I said, to being mm -hmm. read mm -hmm. precisely in that sort of multi-layered or multi-leveled way. Absolutely. And the woman, of course, escapes. I had a um, discussion with uh, uh, in the team that was helping me and at one point um, uh, somebody suggested, they thought that the woman should die at the end and I said, absolutely not. Uh, and that is the twist on the film noir tradition also, you know, or rather it sort of takes film noir and uh, uh, traditions and sort of, you know, it's the woman who is being chased, but it is the woman in the end who escapes, mm -hmm. not the man. Mm -hmm. So we played with a number of different, uh, you know, Eastern and Western But again, I'm intrigued. Ideas. Why do you think she escapes when the man is dead? It sh should be she is triumphant. Why is she still escaping even when the man is dead? Well, because I don't think that... Um, that condition that, has that, changed? That that condition has changed, right. precisely. And I also think that uh, triumphalism suggests a kind of... Um, uh, you know, one party winning and the, uh, at the cost of the other. And I don't think that that's the kind of world that uh, we want. We want a world in which uh, precisely the woman doesn't need to keep escaping and the man doesn't need to be killed or the male element doesn't need to be killed. We have to find some balance between these feminine and masculine elements. Um, I think in the video that balance doesn't actually take place, uh, but I think it's that's meant always to suggest. part of a larger yeah. work, yes. You know, when Faiz Ahmed Faiz, a great poet, he was in Moscow. He had an occasion to meet with Sartre, the French philosopher. And Sartre, according to Faiz, have told him that the great themes of our times belong to the East and the major literary techniques belong to the West. And the great future writers will be one who will combine the two. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening? Um, I do, to, to definitely to quite a degree. I think that one of the uh, perhaps... Uh, the few things that one could say are the boons of globalization are precisely that they have this globalized world has facilitated, technology has facilitated uh, a much more rapid exchange of ideas across cultures and across national boundaries and across class and ethnicity and even gendered boundaries so that I think artists particularly all over the world are very drawn towards experimenting with um, forms that are not perhaps their own indigenous forms and this has led on you know in the level of music um, theater and uh, certainly literature to i think a hybridization of uh, forms techniques and subject matter also because a lot of uh, artists and writers of course you know are crossing national boundaries they're becoming citizens like you and I for example of other countries countries very far removed from their birth lands and so we are in in many ways uh, very fortunate we are enriched with so many different influences on us and uh, so that puts us in a position where we can in fact as artists as writers as uh, intellectuals um, as activists really draw upon this sort of rich, rich world of experience out there. And I do think people are trying to turn. I mean, we had one of our great Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, for example, you know, he, his work was, uh, it really did transcend cultural uh, and national boundaries, became very popular in the West and uh, remained popular in the East and his own homeland. 
Uh, I think a lot of younger bands that we see uh, coming up, for example, in Pakistan are experimenting with such techniques. We had, of course, uh, for a while, you know, I mean, Salman, Ahmed, um, Janoon, uh, doing a lot of that and bringing together, you know, rock with Sufi music with, um, you know, and, and all these Western techniques. I mean, in my own work, uh, certainly because I've been exposed to both sides, I try to do that or as a scholar. I try to do it as an artist, as a poet, and I feel very fortunate uh, on my good days. Of course, on my bad days, I feel like, oh my God, I'm cut up into so many different pieces. But I think um, it's a wonderful thing to have access to. And I think that if we can draw on um, the strengths of humanity wherever it uh, exists, that we can maybe challenge some of these rigid, narrow ideas of a, of a sort of chauvinistic nature that this is pure and this is impure. I mean, I'd like to go beyond that. Well, yesterday when I was trying, uh, last night actually, when I was trying to organize my thoughts for this discussion, I typed the word westernization, mm -hmm. then I typed the word easternization. Mm -hmm. And the dictionary said it was not the correct word mm -hmm. because easternization has not been conceived as a process. Mm -hmm. So do you think while the globe is being westernized, it's also being easternized? Oh, absolutely. And what will be some of the manifestation that you see of that? Well, I think just what we've talked about today, I mean, the kind of work that we're seeing, um, you know, you look at so many uh, novelists, for example, that are named uh, and have won major Western literary prizes, um, happen to have been raised or come from Eastern countries. Uh, you know, look at the work of Arundhati Roy, for example, who is uh, an artist, but also a, a political activist and her work, which is very much rooted in India, both the, her cultural artistic work as well as her, uh, her political work. And she actually combines them so beautifully, doesn't see a difference between uh, you know, those two sides of 